It's good for us to, to pray about the goodness of God. It's good for us to take a moment just to acknowledge again, He's been good to you and to me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're a faithful God and you've been faithful every day of our lives. We thank you, Father, that you never leave us or forsake us. We thank you, Lord, that your goodness is chased after us every day of our lives. We thank you your mercy is chased after us every day. Father, we thank you for every provision that you've placed into our hands. And God, today, as we open up your word again, we pray, Father, that you would bring blessing and, and challenge and inspiration and faith and, and everything we need, Lord, from your word again today. We ask you, Father, that for every one of us, we come with open hearts and with open minds and open ears to hear what you have to say today. Holy Spirit, have your way in our, our gathering this morning, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said together, amen, amen, amen. amen. Fantastic. Please take your, your seats. Great to see you today. Thank you, Simon Bethany, for leading us. We're continuing on the series, and that was then and this is now. If we can maybe get the lights up just a little bit, that would be great. I'm sorry for those of you at the back. I appreciate it's not the best experience when you're right at the far back. I can't see you. I don't know if you can see me. Uh, but we'll, we'll put the lights up a little bit just to be able to see each other, I hope. That would be great. We're hoping to bring the, the, the tiered seating out again just in a few weeks. We've got a big uh, youth event in another two weeks or so. So we need the auditorium just the way uh, it is. But after that, we'll bring the, the, the tiered seating out so it's a little bit more comfortable for you. And get away from those of you in the back row just to say you're alive and well. A wave in the back. Great, great to see you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Try our very best to keep you connected during our, our time uh, together this morning. You know that 84% of us in the room have a smartphone. And I guess many, many, some of you are, and don't tell me now, but some of you are already on it this morning. And 47 million people access the internet in the UK every single day. Uh, for those of most age, we spend about four hours every day on the internet. If you're 18 to 24, it goes up to five hours every day. Don't know what you do with that extra hour. All of us are, are connecting all the time with Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, 5G, whatever. There's 35 million of us on Facebook every day. 58 million on YouTube. 32 million on Instagram. 22 million on TikTok. How many of you remember Zoom, huh? Being active in Zoom. You remember before we, we went into lockdown, there was only about 600,000 every day would be using Zoom. And in April of 2020, after lockdown, it went up to 13 million. Wouldn't you have loved to be a Zoom share owner that day, huh? <laughs> went up to 13 million uh, usage, and that has continued high, a 2,000% increase. We all seem to be so much better connected, and yet we're so much more disconnected. Disconnected and feeling as, as lonely as we've ever done. Disconnected, allowing for, for mental health dysfunction, anxiety, loneliness, it's all around us. And I know some of you, I'm sure, have experienced that moment when somebody is disconnected from you. When you've been disconnected, it's a horrible experience. Maybe perhaps you've been the one who's disconnected from somebody, and you know what a pain is, that pain is when you disconnect. So we're so connected, it would seem digitally, and yet so disconnected. And yet the writer of this uh, book, the, the, the sermon, the letter that we're reading to Hebrews, is trying his very best, actually. And he's writing to a community of Jesus followers who actually are now in a place. They've been in, they're, they're based in Rome, and they're under some significant challenge and difficulty. And he's writing to them to say, you know, I know that you're under real persecution and difficulty. I know you're under real tension and hardship. And you're di thinking about disconnecting from the Christian way of life. You're thinking about disconnecting from the, the church community. You're thinking about disconnecting from the connections of faith that you've made. And heading back to religious practices and heading back to traditions, heading back to rituals and patterns and heading back to external behavior of the Jewish faith. And he said, please, can I encourage you today? There is a better connection and you can experience it today. He's telling the people that in the midst of their difficulties, when they're thinking of disconnecting, that there is a better connection and you can experience it today. They were living in really challenging times and it's described in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 32 to 34. It says, think back, the writer said, on those days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. 
He says, sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule, ridicule and were beaten. Sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things for you that will last forever. It was a difficult time, a hard time. A time that perhaps you can identify with today, a time where they were in the midst of affliction, whether that was physical or actually just mental affliction, but they were afflicted because they were following Jesus. And he said, you remember those afflictions, you remember those times of derision when you were ridiculed, when you were made fool of for being a follower of Jesus, made a fool of for coming to that happy, clappy church that is in the AECC. I don't like when people call that, but I guess... That's the reality. Problems and challenges when we were derided by others. Problems and difficulties they had just because of association, when they were associated with others who were going through difficulties. Problems when they were now in a place of limitation, when their freedoms were being taken from them, freedoms were being removed from them, freedoms were, were confining them to prison, and challenges when stuff that was theirs was taken from them whether it was jobs that they just couldn't find, whether it was livelihoods that they couldn't make anymore. And I guess whatever we are facing today, whatever we have been facing, maybe you're sitting in this place today as it seems connected in a crowd and yet disconnected. Disconnected perhaps from family, disconnected from friends, disconnected from husband or wife, disconnected from your children, disconnected from a future dream, disconnected yet sitting, connected as it were in a crowd. The writer is trying to say to them, but that was then, and this is now, and in this moment called now, there is a better connection, and we can all experience it today. And so that's what we want to talk about for a few minutes today. There's a better connection, and we can experience it today. We've got three elements we're going to say. We're going to talk about a connection that is able, a connection that is stable, and a connection that enables there's a lot of Bible that we're going to try and cover today, but it'll be on the screen behind. But if you're adept with the Word of God, then you can follow through where we're going. But there's a better connection, and we can all experience it today. And number one is it's a connection that is able. Let's read from Hebrews chapter 7 and verses 16 through to 26 together. It says, Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law never made anything perfect, but now we have a confidence in a better hope through which, through which we draw near to God. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath, but there's an oath regarding Jesus. For God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You, Jesus, are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. There were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office forever. But Jesus, because he lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. He's the kind of high priest we need because he's holy and blameless, unsustained, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. A connection that is able. I remember early in lockdown, and some of you will remember, but most of you maybe won't. It's, uh, I'm sure it's all drifted from your memory. But at the end of every Sunday service, we would do a thing called Instagram Live, where we would go on Instagram and, and kind of unpack the service. And there were, we'd interview somebody, and there were questions that would come. And then there was chat that would happen in the room. It was a fun time, but a challenging time. Because I can't remember how many times the connection would go down. I can't remember because we've always said we've got perennial lodgers, which I love, but when the perennial lodgers went on some other devices, the connection would go down. The connection would always go down and we're always stressed that it wasn't gonna work. Sometimes it never worked and we shut down early. We just couldn't able and wasn't able to make the connection. I remember one time I was interviewing Andy McCourt. Andy McCourt is the assistant pastor in a very large church of 10, 15, 20,000 people in Sacramento in Northern California. And I remember the day because he was in his well-lit, purpose-built studio, and I was in my, my studio, which I'm gonna put a picture up, and you'll see my studio. It was my studio. 
You didn't see any of that, you see. You just saw the face at the end of the camera. But that's how we tried to remain connected. And I remember the embarrassment when I was in mid-interview and the connection wasn't able to sustain the conversation, wasn't able to sustain the connection, it was lost. You see, the system we had in our home until halfway through, connect, through lockdown wasn't able to keep the connection going. And the picture is painted here how, I guess, the connections with God, how help from God, how communication with God was made, made through a system of priests. And he's writing, you know, that was the connection that used to be there. There was a connection that was made way, it's called the Old Testament covenant. It was made long ago, it was made through priests who are identified men of a particular tribe of Israel, tribe of Levi. And then down through every generation, right from the very first priest, Aaron, all the way down through history, the priest had been the means by which people made connection with God. God had already given the law, the Ten Commandments. You and I remember and know that story of Moses went up the mountain and got the Ten Commandments. And there had already been a pattern of, of sacrifices and rituals and dates and times and moments and particular behaviors that had been established to say this is how you connect with God. This is how you make your connection. It happens at a particular time of the year in a particular way and you've got to fulfill all of this. And in that moment when you do all of that, you need to shed some blood. And when you, as you shed some blood, then you're able to cover over the sin of your life. You're able then to perhaps receive the forgiveness from God. You're able then to, to ask for his blessing and to acknowledge that God is Lord over the nation. Every year, the priest would make a sacrifice for his own sin, hoping that that would be, a, a, would be an okay sacrifice, that he might be set free and make a connection with God and then on behalf of everybody he was then able to go through the ritual again of going into the place called the holy place and make a sacrifice on behalf of everybody in the nation he did it once for a year and this old covenant or this agreement our means of connection was the way by which all the followers of God were looking to be connected with God it was the way they'd done it for years and years and it was a way of ritual and pattern and, and external behavior that they thought that was the way they could manage to connect with God. If we did this ritual every time, if we went through this process every time, if we did this behavior in a particular way, then that would ma manage for us to get an occasional connection with God and have a relationship with him. But you see, it wasn't able to fulfill that. But the challenge was here was these Christ followers are thinking, we need to go back to that form of ritual. We need to go back to that pattern of behavior. We need to go back to doing some of these external things because of the external things we can find to get a connection with God. And the writer was saying, no, folks, don't go back because there's a better connection that is available for you today and you can experience it today. And that's a connection that is able to make you have a good connection with God. You see, he was trying to say that these under pressure believers, there is a better connection and you can experience it today. And for us in the room today, he's writing to you and to me and to say, for all of us who are trying our very best to live life the way we want to, for all of us who are trying to fulfill this particular task and that particular ritual and this external behavior, there's a better way to connect and it's God is making it available for you and me to experience right here, right now, today. It's the truth that God is able to make a connection that is able to do everything. Why? Because he says so here. He says, you know, it's because God makes a promise. A promise that he doesn't break. I remember when I was a, a, a police surgeon and I would end up in court. And you would end up in court and you'd have to, to say that you'd make a promise that you're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And sometimes they would say to you, here is a Bible which is greater than you, and do you want to do that? Because what was identifying was you're trying to say there's something that is outside yourself and greater than yourself and it's on that basis that you want to make a promise. It's that I will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But here's the, the reality that God trying to communicate with you and me that the everlasting, all creating God of the universe wanted to say I will make, I will, I will make an oath based on myself, my, my, the fact that I never change, the fact that I am forever, the fact that I am all powerful, the fact that I am I'm the God of the universe, I'll still make a promise based on who I am. Oh, if you and I ever need a, a truth from a promise that says God is never going to fail you, God is able, then he makes a promise that says to you and to me, he is able. And on that basis, you and I have a better connection. It was because there was a promise. It was because, as we read there, that Jesus is permanent. 
Priests came and priests go. Uh, people were there. Uh, they were there for a short season representing the, the Israelites and then they would go. But here we have Jesus who once died, who once was buried and who rose again and now is alive forevermore. His priesthood, his ability to intercede for you and for me, his ability to look into your eyes, know the, sh the difficulties that you're in and yet forgive you and want to extend a hand to you and say he's able to meet you at your point of need. He is permanent. He's never going to let you down. He's never going to forsake you. We've already sung that his grace is chasing you and me every day because he's for us every day. It was a, it's a permanent priesthood. It's never going to come or go. It was because he was perfect and pure. He was a holy sacrifice that was made once and for all. He wasn't like you and I who mess up and fail every day. He wasn't like you and I who fall under sin every day. Jesus was that perfect and pure, righteous sacrifice, one that the Father was going to accept and accept for all time. That the death he died on Calvary was for you and for me and would always be able to pay the price of all of our sin and shame and guilt. You may be sitting in here today and thinking there's more that you need to do. You may be sitting in here and thinking today, there are behaviors I need to do. I need to give money. I need to attend church. I need to pray five times a day. I need to be here. I need to be there. I need to do this. I need to do that. And he's saying there is a better connection today. And you can experience it today. It's got nothing to do with your external behavior. It's all because Jesus has made it available. Because he's a permanent priest available for you and for me. Because he's the perfect one that's available for me. Because he's made the promise. And because as the Bible said, he's the one who provides. Hallelujah. It says there's a connection that is able because he's able he says, therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. The word there is used is to rescue, to make safe, to preserve from danger, to restore, to bring back to wholeness, to bring back to health, to bring back to well-being. Oh, come on, it's a connection that provides for you and for me. And I know most of us in the room acknowledge and understand how amazing it is that he is able to save us, that he's been able to save every one of us from ourselves, from the constant sin, from the wrath of God, from a death, uh, an eternity without him. He's been able to save us from all of that. Hallelujah. We give thanks this morning that that's our reality. But you may well be sitting in here today contemplating disconnecting from God. You may be in that journey of disconnecting from God. And thank you for being here today. You may be sitting at home because you don't feel worthy to be in the room today. Thank you for being online. You may be at home because you're feeling disconnected from the family, from God. Thank you for being online today. You may be in the room. Thinking, I don't know if anybody's able to take away this guilt and shame that I carry. I don't know if there's anybody that's able to deal with the, the things that I am thinking, the stuff that I am doing, the way that I am living. Maybe you're in that place thinking, I need to give this aside and to come back and see if I can do some rituals, see if I can make God happy, see if I can do what I need to do myself. And God wants to say to you today, there's a connection that's available that you can experience today. It's a better connection than any ritual, than any practice, than any behavior. It's the internal change that God can bring because he's the one who's able to save you and me. He's able to give you health and well-being and strength and to restore you to who you are. There is a better connection today. And the writer was trying to convey to them in chapter seven there, there is a better way and you can experience it today. There's a better connection because of what God has done for you and for me. You see, when Jesus did that, the reality is he became the assurance that God would faithfully fulfill his part, that man would always be able to confidently depend on God because Jesus is able. And also God would be able to, to depend, as it were, on man because Jesus is able to, to hold the man, take the pain and the weight and bear the weight and the, the price of man's sin and be able to present that before Father God and say, these people are free. These people are forgiven. These people are saved. Come on, if that doesn't fill you this morning with excitement, with gratitude, with thanksgiving for where you're going in your life, I don't know what will. There's a connection that is able, but there's also a connection that is stable. Isn't it so infuriating when you're trying to, to go online, when it's in so infuriating, when you're trying to make a connection and that little wheel that we see there is constantly trying on your phone? It constantly says on your phone, you're connected. I don't know what it's like for you when you go out into the city and you're trying to book a parking ticket, huh? 
Or you're trying to download that map to take you somewhere. Or you're trying to pay a restaurant bill on your phone and you can't get that connection. It's so frustrating. Am I, am I alone here? Oh, good, good. You do get it. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. And we all get it, huh? That frustrating moments when you're trying to get on Facebook and King's guest Wi-Fi is knocking you off again and again. I, thought, I know you thought I couldn't see you, but I see you. I see you this morning trying to get on the King's Guest Wi-Fi and it's knocking you off again and again. You know, the writer to this group of, of persecuted, hard done by, under great stress and pressure people who are thinking we need to disconnect from God in the time of our difficulty. We need to disconnect from Jesus. We need to disconnect from the way of following God. We need to disconnect from being in church. We need to disconnect from everything it means to follow Jesus. And they're trying to reconnect with our history, trying to get back to just living a ritual life, trying to get back. And he's saying, you know what? There's a better connection you can experience today. It's a connection that is able, but it's a connection that is stable. He's trying to say, that there's a connection that will not knock you off. Hebrews 8, we're going there now. Hebrews 8, just a few verses, it says, but, verse six, it says, but now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a mystery, a, sorry, a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he's the one who mediates for us a better covenant with God, based on better promises that we've already said. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. But when God found fault with the people, he said, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They didn't remain faithful to my covenant, so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. And I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Hallelujah. You see, they'd lived in a place of instability when the connection was unstable. That old covenant, that old connection had faults. Verse eight says, he uses the, the tense he uses is a continuous present tense, which says there was always faults. It was always having faults. It was always breaking down. There was always the disconnection. You see, it was always a disconnection because it was dependent on mankind. It was dependent on you and uh, on, on the people of that day. And similarly, it's it was dependent on people just like you and me to keep it. And he said, people couldn't do that. And so the connection was always broken. You see, when you look back in Israel's history, you find that despite them having the law, despite them having the introduction of this is what it looks like, this is how you can live your life, if you endeavor to fulfill these 10 commandments, if you live according to what this law says, then we can perhaps have a connection. And to help you along the way, I'm gonna install some priests. They're gonna be there in position and they're gonna represent you to God. And they're gonna represent God to you and they're gonna take your sin once a year. They're gonna take everything that you've done, all the shame that you carry, all the guilt, all the stuff that you've done, the decisions, and they're gonna come and they're gonna, to, to, as it were, present that before God and they're gonna kill an animal on the behalf of you and, the, and the, the death of that animal will somehow be a picture of what God is going to do to forgive you and to cover the sin and to set you free. But you see, the problem was that the, for 300 years, right through the book of Judges, you see the same pattern again. You see men and women sinning, God disciplining, then men and women repenting, and then God delivering them. It goes again and again. People sin, God disciplines. People repent, God delivers. People sin, God disciplines. People repent, God delivers. People sin, God disciplines. People repent. God delivers. Hey, you look back through your life. I look back through my life. I see that pattern. I sin. God disciplines me somehow. I come to a point saying, God, I am so sorry. I've messed up yet again. And by his grace, he comes and he delivers me again. He says, I love you, Ian. I set you free again. I wash your feet, as it were. You're free again. In this room today, I know there are many. And that's the pattern of your life. A pattern of sin. A pattern of discipline by God. And you think, why is this happening to me? Look back in your life and see the decisions you've made. Look back in your life and see the thoughts that you have. Look back and see the relationships you have. God is endeavoring as a loving father to discipline you, to bring you to a point of repentance. To say, God, I am genuinely so sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have lived that way. 
And by his grace again, he brings deliverance to you. But you see, that was the pattern of life again and again and again. It was unstable. The connection was being made and then lost, made and then lost. I know in this room today, there'll be people in here today and you're grateful that you're here, but nervous that you're here in case God finds you out. (laughs) Nervous that that which is going on in your life is made known. We all have secrets. You have secrets. I have secrets. Poke your neighbor, tell them they have secrets. Everybody has secrets. God sees our secrets. And that's what makes the connection, if we try to make it on our own, unstable. But you see the stability that God is seeing. In verse 10, he said, but this is the new covenant. This is the new connection. This is the new agreement. This is the way. This is the new testament that we're going to make. He says, I will make a new agreement with the people. And on that day, says the Lord, I will put my law on their mind. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Four times God says, I will. You see, I love that, don't you? That God is the one who takes the initiative on behalf of you and me. He's the one who is the initiation. He's the one who says, I'm going to make the connection. I'm not going to be dependent upon them because they're unstable. Hello, they're unstable. He says, I'm not going to wait for them. I'm going to proactively make the connection. If Romans 5, verses 5 and 6 says, and hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured out to our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Hallelujah. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. When you'd no interest in God, when you'd no interest in his ways, when you'd no interest in what he'd done for you, he died for you. He took the initiative to show you this is how much I love you, that I'm going to send my one and only son to die on your behalf. Galatians 4 says, Says, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, let, that you and I might receive sonship and adoption. Come on, come on. I love it that God takes the initiative to make the connection stable. It's got nothing to do with you and me. He takes the initiative to make it stable. He says, I will put the truth in their minds. Come on. What a great illust- uh, illumination that is for us. It doesn't come by what we read and think and, and, and become to a logical understanding. It's by revelation of God, by the acceptance and the surrender and the invitation of God into our lives. He puts something fresh in our minds that we understand afresh what it means that we've been saved, what it means. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed. Don't let your mind be squeezed into the pattern of how everybody else around you thinks, but be transformed be metamorphosized, be changed from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Maybe you're a, don't, well, yeah, I won't go there. You're not a caterpillar today. But that reality of being totally changed, but releasing who God has made on the inside to be released on the outside because you change your mind. You say, God, I surrender to you today. Fill my mind with who I really am. Fill my mind with who you really are. Fill my mind with what you've put in my life to do and accomplish on this planet. Fill my mind with all the joy and the peace and the, 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 the calmness that you give to every one of us. He is going to put it in our minds, but also it says he's going to inscribe it or write it on our hearts, engrave the reality, the permanent message. Up in the corner of our, I've said, I think I've used it before, but up in the corner of our back garden, we had some cement work done. And at the time the cement was wet and I thought, oh, I just want to leave for, for eternity a message. So I put Ian loves Elizabeth, you know, in the cement. I engraved it in the cement because I wanted every, I know, I love Lydia, but I wanted every generation to know that Ian loves Elizabeth. And I put Ian, and then I put my heart, you know, and then I put Elizabeth, put the date. It's a permanent message that's recorded in the cement in our back garden. And when we're gone, and that, if the Lord hasn't come back, somebody's going to say, I wonder who Ian was. I wonder who Elizabeth was. But they certainly loved each other enough for him to scribe on the, the thing. I just love the picture that God has, not that one, but God has written on our hearts a message that is permanent that he loves us, that he's for us, that it's not about the external ritual, it's about the internal relationship. It's not, I see in the Old Testament, yeah, yeah, you can clap there, okay. I'll give me a, yeah. He's saying to you and to me, it's stable because the message never changes. He always loves you, he always has loved you, he always will love you. I know you're sitting in here today and you don't think you're loved. 
You don't think that God loves you because of what you've done, because of the decisions you've made, because of really who you are deep inside. I need you to know that he's written on our hearts today, I love you. We've already been reminded right at the start, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. It's not about external ritual. It's about our internal relationship. It's not about what you do on the outside. It's about who you know on the inside. It's not about the geographical placement that they had at a temple or a particular place. It's not about coming here. It wasn't about coming at King Street. It's about the cardiographical placement. It's about where your heart is. That's what he's trying to say. I'm going to write on your heart a permanent message that says, I love you. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. You see, that's why we get a stable connection. It's never unstable because if it were, and it was dependent on you and me, we'd always be knocking each other off. He says, I will be their God, which means he gives himself to you and to me, and they will be my people, which means he takes you and me to himself. It's that position of intimacy. That's what stability is about. There's a better connection that's available for you and me today. A connection that is able by what Jesus has done to give you a relationship with God the Father, to give you a plan and a purpose and hope and a future, as Tom shared so powerfully last week. But it's also a connection that is stable. He's never gonna knock you off. He's never gonna to put you away. He loves you with an everlasting love. There's a connection that is able. It's a connection that is stable. And finally this morning, it's a connection that enables. You see, I remember back in the late 80s when I was a general practitioner, I mean, before a lot of you were born, but back in the 1980s and the 1990s, I was a general practitioner in the city. And I remember before cellular phones were, were developed, it was a tragedy for us as a family because if I was on call for the weekend, which I was every second weekend when I first started as being a GP, that meant Elizabeth was, was fixed in the house from five o'clock on Friday through to 8 a.m. on Monday. Couldn't leave the house in case a patient phoned. And at the time, of course, everybody just had home phones, but not everybody had home phones. Some people would go to that thing, historical antique thing called a red box. You remember them? You would go to, to them and you would dial up a number and you'd, you'd speak to, is that the doctor? And Elizabeth said, well, yes it is, which was not true. She wasn't, but she behaved as though she was. She said, yes, it's, uh, yeah, what can I do for you? And then she would endeavor to give advice. If any of you were ever my patients and you ever got advice from Elizabeth, I am so sorry. Uh, she's not here today, so I, I've got free reign. It's a dangerous place. <laughs> But there's a reality that I would go out, say, farewell, my love, the one of the love of my life. I'd give her a hug, I'd give her a kiss on Saturday morning or maybe even Friday night. And then we'd sometimes see each other over the weekend. Because I would go from red box to red box at any more calls, any more calls. Sometimes if there was somebody in the house, I would use their phone, any more calls. Then you got those things called pagers. None of you know what a pager was, but it used to beep, beep, beep. And I knew Elizabeth, I then had to phone a number, which would put me through to the house and I'd get. And I remember the day I got this cellular phone. Whoa, a Motorola. Praise the God from whom all blessings flow. But the thing was like a, a it was like a massive bag, you know. You listen. So I used to go to patients and they would think, what is this doctor on? Because I would have my bag with all my tricks in it. I would sometimes have a rucksack in my back with all the special stuff. And then I would have this bag with this massive brick in it, which was a mobile phone. And I would, I would have all these things and I would arrive at the door and they would say, doc, it's just got a sore throat. I didn't, what, do you, what, do you got all the, what do you got the stuff with? You're not gonna do surgery in the kitchen on me, are you? But it was amazing. And then I remember when this thing came on the go. Oh, antiques, none of you remember this bad boy. This is the Nokia 3310. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nokia 3310, come on. How many had a Nokia 3310? Ah, I love it, I love it. Welcome home, yeah. That transformed my life. But of course, there was a reality that all it could do was text and phone. But that was a dream. And then, of course, we've we'll got this bad boy in front of me, huh? That is able to tell you things and speak to you and speak to anybody and go all over the world and get a flight. And I know some of you are trying to book your flights right now. <laughs> I was going to try and send you all a text 
via church suite. I haven't got myself set up, but I was gonna give you all a text just to say we're connected. <laughs> but this thing connects you everywhere, huh? You can do your shopping from listening to Ian preach. You can get the doctor to tell you what you need to do. You can go and book a, a holiday somewhere. And I hope none of you have done that. <laughs> But it's what a little device can do that enables our lives to be transformed. It's what a connection can do that enables. But the writer is saying there is now a better connection and a connection that enables so much more. And as we finish today, it's in chapter 10, just a few verses from 19 to 20. It says, and it's up behind us again. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus, because he was able. By his death, Jesus opened new and living way, made possible a better connection through the curtain and into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules us over God's house, here's the outcome of the better connection today. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but let us encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. A better connection enables you and me to do five things. It enables us because of what he says here. He says, that, let us, come on. In response to what God has done, in response to the fact that God has made a connection that is able, in response to God that, that He's done a connection that for you and for me is stable, it's never going to go away. Then come on, let us do what we can do. Let us be enabled by that great connection to be the women and the men that we're supposed to be. Let us be enabled to do what God is calling us to do in this day, in this season. Yes, it may be hard for you and me. I don't know all the difficulties that you're going through, but the prayer requests that come in demonstrate and, and, and reaffirm week by week that we're going through some stuff. But can I encourage you again today? God is able. Jesus has made a better connection because he's able. He's never going to let that connection go. It's a stable connection. But that connection is that you and I might be enabled. Enabled what? Number one, we've got that entitlement. I hate the word entitlement. Can't stand it. But this is one place where you and I need to acknowledge that our better connection is our backstage pass. You and I are entitled to go backstage right into the presence of God. It allows you and me moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day access to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, to moment by moment forgiveness, to moment by moment kindness, to moment by moment grace, to moment by moment peace, to moment by moment joy, to moment by moment His presence in our lives. Every moment you and I are entitled because of what Jesus has made, the connection for us. It's a connection that enables entitlement. It's a connection that enables attachment. Tom shared so powerfully. If you weren't here last week, get the download, watch the video, connect. I'll even allow you to connect right now because it's better than what I'm getting on this week. But anyway, attachment. Hold tightly to the rope of hope because God is never going to let go of his end. Come on. I remember the first time I tried abseiling. You know that moment when you have to go, I'm not gonna do it, but you know that moment you go over the edge? Yeah, I'll go this way. You remember you go over the edge and he says, lean back. Yes? Yeah. Absailors, help me here. He says, lean back. He says, I've got you. Yeah. I've got you. I love that. This morning for somebody in the room, God wants to say to you, I've got you. Yeah. You're thinking you're falling. You're thinking you're disconnecting. You're thinking it's all going bad. He says to you this morning, I've got you. Fret not, fear not. It may feel as though you're leaning back and failing and leaning back and falling. He says, I've got you. Because he enables you and me to have that attachment. He enables you and me to have that empowerment. He says, think of ways to motivate one another. You know what the word means there? The word is paroxysm where hooping, I hope none of you had hooping cough, but hooping cough is a disease It's called a disease of paroxysmal coughing, where it's just a, a, a sharp, kind of <coughs> like with all force and with all power. And it's just in a moment, it's like if you have an epileptic seizure, it's a paroxysm. That's the word that is used. It's like you've got God's permission to poke your neighbor and encourage him. I'm, I'm, I'm saying gently poke your neighbor. <laughs> gently poke your neighbor and encourage them. It says how you can spur one another on to love and good deeds. Our whole life as Christians, 
should be poking gently and not physically, but spurring each other on to love and to good deeds. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what the connection with God enables you and I to do. Everybody poking and spurring each other on to love and to good deeds that you and I might be committed. That commitment, it says, I'm not gonna neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Hey, can I encourage you? I know most people now don't make the habit of being in God's house a weekly experience. That's not your habit anymore. I hope it's not because of instability in the connection. You're connected one week and you're disconnected the next. I hope it's not because you fall out and you fall in. But the writer to the Hebrews took time to say, you know what, you need to, you're enabled to make that commitment. I guess Elizabeth and me have done it all our lives. Why? For so many reasons. We didn't want to miss out in the moment that God might be in the house. He's in the house every time, but we never wanted to miss out. I never wanted to miss out an expression of worship and the expression of prayer. I never wanted to miss that out. I know when I fell in love with Elizabeth, I was so in love that I tell you, I never missed an appointment. I don't know about you, maybe you were in love, but you did it a different way. But when I was in love, I was never late and I never missed an appointment. Hello. And yet we, we take our love for Jesus a little bit more casually, huh? We're not here. We're maybe late. We don't come every week. I know you've got appointments this week. I know you've got work to go to this week. That which is important to you. Hey, you've got a habit that Monday morning at 9 a.m. or half past eight, for some of you half past six, you're there because that's what's important to you. If this community of men and women of which we're connected together is important to you, then he's saying, be committed. As some are in the habit of not meeting together, why don't we be in the habit of meeting together? You see, what I've learned in life is when you get out of that habit, it's so easy to drift. It's so easy, you just drift. One week becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes six, and when six becomes eight, it's really difficult to come back because then you've got all the embarrassment, then you've got all the shame, then you've got what people will think. Can I say to you, I couldn't give a rip how long you've been away, please come. I couldn't give a rip how long you've you've disappeared, please come. Because it's so better to be in the house of God together, worshiping and praising. And he says, finally, it's that encouragement, building and putting courage into each other. Not taking away, not subtracting, but adding and multiplying and building each other up. That's what a connection that enables, helps you and me to do, to encouragement. And so, no wonder he says, right at the conclusion, See, hey, you may be in Hebrews 10, 32 to 36. He said, you may be going through difficult times. You may be going through real challenges. You may be suffering same things. You may be suffering with those who, so you may be in that place of ridicule. You may be in that place of, of despair and disappointment. But in verse 35, he says, he says, don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Don't throw it away. Don't disconnect. Remember, there's a great reward from being connected. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that He has promised. Don't throw away this morning your confidence in God. Don't throw away your connection to God. Don't throw away your connection to God's people. There's a better connection and you can experience it today. A connection that is able to keep you in relationship with God. A connection that is stable. He'll never leave you or forsake you. A connection that will enable you to fulfill everything that He has for your life. Hey, we're gonna stop. But for some today, it may well be it's your moment to make that first connection. Maybe you've never connected with Jesus Christ before. Maybe you've heard this story so many times, but you thought it was about coming to church. You thought it was about doing this or doing that. You thought it was about giving. You thought it was about doing good works. You thought it was about behaving in a particular way. You thought it was a routine that you had to do. Turn up on Sunday, give your money, do some good things. Maybe you thought I was always about, no. Today may be your first opportunity to make that internal connection for God to write on your heart, I love you. So we're gonna give a moment of opportunity if that's your first connection that you want to make today. And for others today, maybe it's your chance to reconnect. And so let's just bow our heads just as we finish this morning, close our eyes, just so we give respect for those that are hearts beating, mouth is dry. 
know they need to say something with God to God. Know they need to reconnect. Know it takes a bit of humbling. But God's after you today. God's looking to you today. Father, we pray, Lord, for everybody in the room today, God, that's on that journey to disconnection or already living at that place called disconnection. Father, we thank you for all the lessons we learned from the past, Lord. Recognizing, God, it's not about what we do on the outside. It's about who you want, us to, ch- who you want to change us to on the inside. Father, we thank you that Jesus died on our behalf. He died once and for all, that he might always intercede on our behalf. We thank you that he took all our shame and guilt and disappointments. We thank you that he did all that for us, that we might now have the opportunity to be connected forever and to have eternal life. And so, Father, for all those, Lord, in that moment of decision, I pray you give them courage and strength. For those, Lord, who need to reconnect again, I pray, Father, that you'd be with them this morning also. In Jesus' name. Just keep your your heads down and your eyes closed for a second. We have a a New Testament book again that will remind you of how Jesus connects with each one of us. And if today you'd say, could somebody pray for me? Could somebody come alongside me? Could somebody help me? If that is you today, and you're saying, I would love to take that first step of connection with Jesus Christ, then wherever you're at, in the front or the back of the auditorium, can you can you just wave your hand and we'll, we'll see. Is there anybody in the room this morning? Anybody at all? What about those that need to make a reconnection today? Over on the left, the right, right hand side, yeah, thank you, thank you, sir. What about those that need to make a reconnection today? You've drifted, you've disconnected, but today's the day you're saying, okay, we're done. Thank you, Lord, that you want to connect with me again. There is a better connection, and I'm getting experience in today. As I'm in the room, you know you've been drifting, but today's your day. If that's you, then just put your hand up too. We'll pray for you just in a second. Anybody in the room? Praise God. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for so many in the room, Lord, that have got a, that depth of connection with you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for those, Lord, who are already living, Lord, in that new covenant, that place where they know that Jesus is alive inside. We've got that intimate relationship with you, Father. I pray that for everyone, God, today, as we step forward, Lord, knowing that that was then, that was yesterday, and this is now today, Lord, we walk in that place of deep connection, growing and developing and deepening with you every day. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen, amen, amen.